Okay, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, so the, my third um, and final unit to be taught here is uh, unit four. And unit four is all about looking at where ideas come from. Um, and this is basically the lifeblood of the innovation process. So having looked at the formal processes, the formal structures about how we organise taking an idea through to fruition, through to um, an idea becoming an innovation, how it's translated and put into um, use in a public sector organisation or into a product or service into the marketplace. Um, we need to actually stop and reflect and think about where do ideas come from. And ideas are important not just at the early stage of the innovation process. You don't just have a process of generating ideas about what kinds of products and services we might want to develop. We also need to think about ideas that help us with the solutions during the innovation process. So ideas don't just come at the start, they come up they come into the process all through the process of innovation. And I think it's also important to say that they come into the process from all different sources. Now traditionally, what we've seen in um, innovation studies, particularly in the 1970s, 1980s, is a focus on thinking about how do teams and individuals innovate. And so during the 1970s and 80s in particular, there was a lot of focus on brainstorming techniques. How do individuals and teams brainstorm and, and generate new ideas? Now the problem with this approach is that it assumes that somehow the idea is within us, the solution is within us, and if we only talk enough it will come out. What we see increasingly is actually ideas exist everywhere. And we shouldn't as organizations or members of organizations or members of innovation teams think that we have all the solutions and all the ideas we need to look outside and this does connect with a more social network social interaction perspective of innovation so rather than thinking about how do we mobilize the psychology um, of teams and and thinking about how we think as individuals we need to start thinking about how we interact with others who might have ideas so what we see is that actually when we look at successful innovation, most of the ideas do not come from individuals in the team or the team itself. They come from outside of the team. And often they come from outside of the organisation. My PhD was based on about 40 or 50 successful innovations that have won the Queen's Award for Technology or the Design Award. Um, and these are British UK awards for innovation. What that PhD was about was looking at informality, the role of social networks in the innovation process. But before I could look at those aspects, I had to look at where the ideas came from throughout the, that innovation process. The ideas that were used to generate the projects, the ideas that were used to create the solutions, etc., etc. And what I found from my study, but also supporting prior studies and subsequent studies who also supported this, is that something like about two-thirds of the ideas, let's just say a majority, come from outside of the organisation. They come from customers, potential customers, and those might be consumers like you or an I, but, or they might be industrial customers, depending on the kinds of products and services we're talking about. They come from suppliers, suppliers such as Samsung to Apple. Um, they come from competitors. Actually, competitors are a really important source um, of, of ideas, either because we take their products and services and we try and look at what has led to those products, or we try and uh, break them down and think about the different components which are being used. So we can either look at them from a distance or we can actually interact with our competitors. Interestingly, Samsung and Apple, for example, are both suppliers and competitors. Um, so there's, there's interesting relationships that go along there. Believe it or not, universities are also a source of ideas and what you see is there are plenty of academics um, not only creating ideas that are used by business, but often leading to spin-off organisations. Um, one of my um, one of my case studies for my PhD was a company that you might know of, um, recently been bought by a Japanese company, Arm, 
And when I interviewed them 20 years ago, there were actually about 13 individuals. They're a multi-billion pound organisation now, but they were originally a spin-out from a university that became um, a, a small entrepreneurial firm and eventually an international and a very influential uh, organisation. So during um, Unit 4 then, we will be looking at um, where ideas come from and be looking at concepts such as closed versus open innovation and how do companies make themselves more amenable to ideas that come from outside? How do they make their boundaries more porous? And one of the concepts that we'll be looking at that unit and, and actually all of the innovation units is this idea of boundary spanning. It's really important that organisations boundary span internally between the different functions and that's something that James and Elke and I alluded to in the earlier discussion. But also boundary spanning is really important when we start looking at external boundaries. Talking to individuals um, and organisations that are outside of our, um, our normal um, boundaries. So talking to companies from different sectors, talking to individuals in other organisations. So boundary spanning is a concept that is core to innovation and is core to the three units um, that I, I will be talking about. And hopefully you can, you'll see them also relevant to marketing and, and operations management. OK, I'll stop there and I'll hand you over, my, over to Elkie and then subsequently James.